Now, I just briefly want to make you, make the people understand, how can anyone do something like this? And for that, I have to explain to you what is RSS. RSS, Mr. Narendra Modi is a life member of RSS. RSS was an organization that was inspired by Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, came about in 1925. They believed in racial purity, racial superiority. They also believed they were an Aryan race like the Nazi believed they were an Aryan race. All that I'm saying can be verified. This is the time of information revolution. You can Google all this, what I'm saying. But it is very important for me to explain this to you so you know what is happening in India. This RSS believed in the ethnic cleansing of Muslims from India. The, at one point, there was racial superiority of the Hindu race. Secondly, it was hatred for the Muslims and for the Christians because they believed that this golden age of Hindu civilization was stopped because of Muslim rule centuries back and then the British rule of India. So it was racial superiority and hatred for Muslims and Christians. This is openly stated. You look at the, the founding fathers of RSS, Golwakar and uh, Savar Savarskar. Just Google them and you'll find out. And this, this ideology of hate is, is what murdered the great Mahatma Gandhi in 1948. It was this ideology of hate that made Narendra Modi in 2002 do a pogrom against Muslims in Gujarat when he, he was the chief minister. He allowed three days for these RSS these RSS goons who were inspired by the Hitler brown shirts, they actually wear brown shirts. The, this RSS, the previous, the Congress Home Minister, the Congress Home Minister gave a statement that in RSS camps, terrorists are being trained. And these terrorists butchered 2,000 Muslims and 150,000 Muslims were made homeless. Narendra Modi could not travel to the U.S. because of that. And I need to make you understand this background before I explain to you that what sort of a mindset would lay siege to 8 million people with 900,000 troops? Women, children, sick people, locked in as animals. In fact, of what I know of England, if 8 million animals were locked in, the RSPCA would have made a lot of noise about it. These are human beings. <laughs> and Mr. President, what comes with racial superiority, these illusions of Aryan superior race, is arrogance. The two go together. And it's arrogance that makes people make mistakes and do stupid things, cruel things like what Narendra Modi has done. It's sheer arrogance. And it's arrogance that has blinded him from the fact that what is going to happen when the curfew is lifted? Has he thought about it? This hasn't been thought through. What is he going to do when he lifts the curfew? Does he think that people of Kashmir will quietly accept the status quo because the, India has changed the constitution and taken away the special status? They'll accept that? Mr. President, 100,000 Kashmiris have died in the past 30 years because they were denied the right given by the United Nations, the right for self-determination. 
100,000 have died and 11,000 women have been raped. There are two human rights, United Nations human rights reports on this. The world hasn't done anything because India is a huge market, 1.2 billion people. Sadly, the material prevails over the human. But this has serious consequences. Again, I repeat, that's why I'm here. Look, what is going to happen when the curfew is lifted will be a bloodbath. The people will come out. There are 900,000 troops there. They haven't come to, as Narendra Modi says, he's done this to, for prosperity of Kashmir. This is supposed to be for the development. These 900,000 troops, what are they going to do when, the demo, when they come out? There'll be a bloodbath. Has he thought it through what happens then? Mr. President, has anyone thought that what happens when there is a bloodbath? What do you think the impact will have on people of Kashmir? What do you think they will think the way they have been boxed in, in their houses, treated like worse than animals, no rights, thousands of all the political leadership have, has been arrested, taken out of Kashmir. Even those Kashmiri leaders who were pro-India have been taken out. 13,000 boys have been picked up and taken to God knows which destinations. So what do they think? What, what, what will the people of Kashmir do when they lift the curfew? They will be out in the streets. And what will these soldiers do? They will shoot them. They've already used pellet guns, blinded young boys. In the last six years, the, the five years, the oppression that has gone on in Kashmir. And so Kashmiris will be further radicalized. Mr. President, there will be another Palwama. And guess what? India will blame us. They're already blaming us. They're saying this: all this is happening because of Pakistan. One of their... Uh, Defense minister said there are 500 terrorists lined up on the border to go in. Why would Pakistan send 500 terrorists when there are 900,000 troops? What impact are they going to make? What will they do? And why would? Don't we know that the moment there is some terrorist attack, all that will happen is there'll be further cruelty and oppression of the people of Kashmir. We will just give the 900,000 troops to further crush the people of Kashmir. And then we'll give the Indian government an excuse that, look, Pakistan is a terrorist state and this mantra that has gone on, Islamic terrorism. The moment you use this, this catchword, Islamic terrorism, the whole world turns away. No one talks about human rights. You can do whatever you want, which is what has happened in Kashmir, because they keep using this word, Islamic terrorism. And this is what they're doing right now. What do we benefit from, from uh, uh, further increasing the cruelty on the people of Kashmir? And, and, and why would we want this? But there is no other narrative left for India. As as when they lift the curfew, whatever happens, Pakistan will be blamed. And there is always a danger of another Palwama. They will again, they might come and bomb us again. And then another cycle might start. And what does Narendra Modi think? That 180 million Muslims of India are thinking right now. Aren't they watching these Kashmiris stuck inside like in, uh, for 55 days they've been stuck in. Aren't they watching? What do you think? Don't you think that the Muslims will be radicalized in India? And I'm talking about 180 million people. And when they get radicalized, there will be some incident in India somewhere down the line. Again, we will be blamed. And I'm warning you right now, again, we will be blamed. And, Mr. President, what about 1.3 billion Muslims who are watching this? 
and they know that it is only happening in Kashmir because they're Kashmiri Muslims. This is not happening to Kashmiri Hindus. They know that this is happening because of their religion. So what do you think they will be thinking? What do you think the Jewish community would think if, the, if there were, forget, 8 million, 8,000 8, Jews stuck like this? What do you think Europeans would think? What, what do we think? I mean, any human community, if their members are stuck like that, what, what do you think they will think? Are we a, a children of a lesser God? Is it not going to cause us pain? And then, and then, and then I'll tell you what will happen. People will, in the 1.3 billion Muslims, someone will pick up arms. I know we've been brought up with films, Western films. This good, decent guy doesn't get justice. He decides to pick up a gun and start seeking justice. There was a film made in New York, famous film called Death Wish. This guy gets mugged by his, uh, and his family, uh, his wife gets killed or something. He can't get justice. He pick, picks up a gun and he goes around shooting muggers. And the whole cinema cheers him on. So what do you think the Muslims are thinking right now? If there is a bloodbath, there will be Muslims becoming radicals, not because of Islam, but because of what they will see, that there's no justice when it comes to Muslims. There were Rohingya Muslims, my, Myanmar, who, was, who are, God knows, almost a million people out, ethnic cleansing. What was the response of the world community? So what do you think will be the response of 1.3 billion Muslims. I picture myself. I'm in Kashmir. I've been locked up for 55 days. I have heard about, and there are rapes, Indian army going into homes, soldiers. I, would, I, would I want to live this humiliation? Would I want to live like that? I would pick up a gun. You're forcing people. You are forcing people into radicalization. When people lose the will to live, what is there to live for? And this is what, if you can do this to human beings, you are actually radicalizing people. And so, uh, Mr. President, I, I want to repeat here, this is one of the most critical times. There will be a reaction to this. Pakistan will be blamed. Two nuclear armed countries will come face to face like we came in February. And before we head in that direction, the United Nations has a responsibility. This is why. This is why the United Nations came into being in 1945. You were supposed to stop this happening. I feel we are back to 1939. Munich. Czechoslovakia has been taken, annexed. What is the world community going to do? Is it going to appease a market of 1.2 billion, or is it going to stand up for justice and humanity? If, if this goes wrong, you hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst. If a conventional war starts between the two countries, Mr. President, if a conventional war starts and it could, anything could happen, but supposing a country seven times smaller than its neighbor is faced with the choice, either you surrender 
or you fight for your freedom till death? What will we do? I ask myself this question. And my belief is, la 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 la, there is no God but one. And we will fight. And when, and when, and when, and when a nuclear armed country fights to the end, it will have consequences far beyond the borders. It will have consequences for the world, which is why I repeat I'm here. Because I'm warning you, it's not a threat. It's a fair worry that where are we headed? And it is, I've come here to tell the UN, you've got to, this is a test for the United Nations. You are the one who guaranteed the people of Kashmir the right of self-determination. They are suffering because of that. And this is the time. This is the time not to appease like in 1939 appeasement took place. This is the time to take action. And number one action must be that India must lift this inhuman curfew, which has lasted for 55 days. It must free. It must free all political prisoners, and especially those 13,000 boys that have been picked up. Parents don't know where they've disappeared. And then the world community must give the people of Kashmir their right of self-determination. Thank you.